so my name is Steven, and I run a company. Uh, we help people migrate to the cloud. Um, and the topic I'd like to share with you today is something I'm pretty passionate about. Uh, my background, uh, I have a degree in systems engineering, uh, and about 20 years experience building, uh, designing, building, and operating systems in various industries from uh, semiconductor manufacturing, banking, uh, high scale e commerce, um, healthcare, et cetera. So, I'm really excited about this talk. The biggest pr challenge I have, or I had when writing this talk, is condensing uh, a four year degree and 20 years of things that I want to you know, share into half an hour. So please find me uh, elsewhere, uh, either in the common area or in, uh, on Twitter. Uh, there'll be, you know, my, my uh, Twitter handle is here, uh, and it'll also be at the end. So I love this stuff. I am here solely to kind of share some joy and, and maybe smooth out some bumps that you might uh, otherwise uh, run into on your own way. So without further ado, I uh, can turn on my little pointer. And let's imagine for a moment that you're an engineer who's landed their first big project, you're gonna lead it, or maybe you're trying to demonstrate to your team that I'm ready to take on this, this new big thing. Um, th that's, that's really who I'm trying to uh, speak to today. There's gonna be other stuff. Um, but I want to uh, help you think about this problem of like how do I how do I take on this bigger challenge and manage it because it's it's too big for uh, one one person. How do I think about this whole system and improve the processes that are uh, running the business? And so, in today's talk, we'll cover like how to define the problem, a general approach to developing and evaluating solutions. And then thinking about how you can review and make a decision and like get moving on. Uh, so this isn't just me uh, that's, that it's an, uh, an interesting topic for. I give you Eli Goldratt, author of The Goal, whose uh, work has inspired a lot of what's going on in, in the lean and DevOps world and comes from an a academic uh, principle called theory of constraints and like what's happening at your bottleneck. But you know, when we're trying to build systems and make changes, we, we need to answer some simple questions. What do we want to change? Um, what should we change it to? And then how do we get there? Like, how do we actually affect that change? How do we implement that change? So we'll get into that. Uh, at a meta level, I think about this in terms of a, an iterative cycle. Let's like, listen to what's going on. Let's explore the solution space. Uh, Think about how we're going to solve this problem, write it down, repeat. Uh, and eventually we'll converge to something that is better. Uh, and at a, the meta goal from an architectural design perspective is to think about the structure and the connections between components, people, um, companies. And like, we want to make good decisions about these things because they're hard to change. Uh, and we need to become comfortable with the fact that we may not and or, and or will not make a perfect decision, uh, but that we need to make a decision and move on because not making a decision is also a decision. So let's dive in, De define the problem. And this is very important. Uh, so one of my favorite leaders in the lean world, uh, Ash, who uh, wrote Running Lean and uh, runs a thing, runs a SaaS tool called Scaling Lean, or sorry, Lean Stack. He talks about loving the problem and not your solution. Engineers in particular, and, and I, I self-identify as an engineer still, uh, we often get very invested in our solutions. Um, and what we really need to be under, you know, focused on is what is the, the customer problem? What is the business problem? What pain are they feeling? So let's, Pretend for a minute that we're, a, we're an aspiring security or systems engineer, and we're running a bunch of containerized applications. And I'm going to use this example throughout the talk. Uh, and like, oh my goodness, we have containers out there that contain vulnerabilities that we don't know about. And OK, this is, this is the start of a problem statement, but I kind of feel like 
This is like the Ferris Bueller clammy hands symptom. Like, yeah, there's something there, but it's not very specific. Um, like, we really ought to do better because um, that will help guide our solution. So first off, let's, let's figure out and, and document how do people solve this problem right now, which is like that we have uh, vulnerabilities running around in container application images and containers. Um, and so what we can do is we can map out the system. Uh, so this is a, what I, what I consider a, like a riff, it's a combination, a mashup of a classic system block diagram plus some process flow plus a little bit of just like commentary to help make it easier to read. And uh, I think I saw uh, Kat talking about a similar thing earlier. Like let's make our illustrations of the system accessible to the right people so that we can get inputs from many different perspectives. Um, so, and, and this is kind of a bugaboo of mine in that like I, I often feel constrained uh, until I set myself free uh, by uh, some of the, like, the classic design um, like strictures. So like make sure you're communicating what you need to communicate. And what, we wanna, what I wanna communicate today about this process is that like there's this, there's this process in the interior that I've kind of zoomed in on where we have application engineers when they uh, you know, have some update to their application, there's an application build pipeline that feeds a, a, an app, a Docker image pipeline that packages up this application. So you've got your application build pipeline that creates like a jar or an NPM package or what have you. And you know, that gets put into an artifact repository um, and we say, oh, well, our, our forward-looking uh, systems engineering team or, you know, whoever's managing deployments is like, oh, well, you know, let's use containers to deploy things. There are some advantages there because it's very portable and, and easy to package. Um, so those application artifacts get pumped in and, and built into a, uh, what's called a Docker image, which is essentially a fancy, uh, TarGZ archive with a bunch of metadata in it that makes it easy to handle. And so what's happening is you have application artifacts that get built into this thing. Uh, we have what's called a base image, which is essentially a copy of operating system libraries um, that are necessary for the application. Uh, they get put in the image. And then we publish this thing to a registry, uh, a thing called a registry, which is really just a, a, another fancy term for an artifact uh, repository. And okay, now we're like, we have this artifact that we can go deploy. And there's, you know, Rob just finished up with a talk about like, let's you know, deploy databases on Kubernetes and, and so forth. Um, so we're, we can deploy applications into these like fancy clusters. And the, the interesting thing that's happening here is now we have a copy of OS and application libraries and the application itself um, which may contain vulnerabilities in this artifact repository, as well as these other uh, repositories, um, as well as containers that may have been, uh, that have been deployed with this application to run this application. And we, while we have customers who are using the application, we also have uh, this hacker guy who's trying to get in and attack the application. And now this attacker has uh, this surface area that he can attack. And when I talked about having uh, the problem being like, well, we have these, these uh, vulnerable applications, like, well, what does that really mean? Well, out here at the edge, our customer's data is exposed, right? That is primarily uh, what uh, this particular hacker is after. Um, um, and so, like, you know, what can we do about that? Well, uh, so let's go back to, like, refining this problem statement. And we should observe what the work is to actually perform this update, like to, to make a, an application image no longer vulnerable. Like, let's listen to the stories. What pain are people feeling? Why, like, like, like why specifically is it terrible? Um, like, why can't we update this thing quickly? Um, and I recommend studying the exception process specifically. This is, exception processes are where the existing system has broken down and people are working around it. And this is where, this is, this is why the system is resilient. It's why it's still running and functioning and doing and providing most of its business value. But it's people filling in gaps. 
Uh, and sometimes we need to do something about that. So when we talk about when I talk about describing the problem space, I think of it as like this multifaceted like you know gem uh, that that you know we can think about and um, hold in our mind hopefully. And it's primarily about people, this uh, a refined problem statement uh, that we can craft a solution for. We can describe the expected benefits of that solution. Um, describe a few of the key use cases within the system that the system must support and enable. Uh, and then some context and requirement. And like this all together is what I think of as describing the problem space. And so the, you know, firstly, we need to identify the users and stakeholders. So we've already mentioned in the story a few of these people, security engineers. There's a manager that's like herding cats to make sure that this update happens. Um, there's an operations engineer that verifies that containers are no longer uh, vulnerable. Um, there's the application engineer that is ultimately responsible for maybe the correctness of the behavior of the application, and release engineers like providing glue and, and all sorts of supporting things um, to make that delivery pipeline happen. So, oops. So what I'm going to show is things I've ex excerpted from a template, a design template that I use. And there will be a link to this, and it'll be public uh, at the end, so don't worry about the exact wording here. But, like, let's describe our problem in one to three sentences and specifically talk about how it affects our customers, business, or organization. Uh, so we might reword that problem statement. And we might say that our containerized application deployment changes our attack surface, and every container gets its own file system containing libraries and code and separate from our host file system, which we have uh, tools to identify vulnerabilities there, but we can't see into the containers. And so the effect is that uh, an application breach may expose customer data to a vulnerability at this container layer. Uh, and additionally, the whole process for remediating these issues is uh, not great. And so we have increased remediation time and effort. So maybe we can do something about that. And so now we can start to describe the expected benefits in a similar fashion. And we should also say when whatever we're going to propose isn't going to solve a significant part of the problem statement. Um, but so we might say that you know, the expected benefits of whatever solution that solves and supports this system and re-implements and improves the system it's going to protect customers by notifying people that there's something wrong, that there's a vulnerability that's significant. And we need to also encourage and, and improve the cycle time for remediating these vulnerabilities. Um, perhaps we're going to trigger some updates. And so again, now, we can, now we're starting to uh, put a box around this problem. And we can describe, you know, the current solution. So we already kind of we went through a diagram on that. Um, but we can describe significant constraints in the environment and major business and technical requirements. Like how will we know when we're done or like at a high level whether this thing is going to succeed. And by at a high level, I mean something that a, a sponsoring stakeholder can, will understand and that the whole team, like, so, so not just the people implementing, but the, the people uh, around the team that um, are supporting this whole system will understand too, and using the system. So, uh, you know, our current solution is that uh, security notifies apps and ops teams of critical vulnerabilities, and they track the remediation in Jira. And the managers herd cats to make sure that this happens. Um, and I can imagine there are meetings, right? Uh, and constraint-wise, maybe we have a company policy that says we we prohibit the presence of uh, vulnerabilities scoring high or critical uh, out in production, and that over the long run, we can allocate at most half of, of an, an engineer to govern this whole thing. Not, not like make it happen, but like to make sure that it is happening correctly. Um, and you know, maybe we have a budget to solve the problem. Maybe it's 50K plus 15K ongoing for maintenance. So how do we, OK, so that, those are constraints. Um, and from a business perspective, uh, you know, maybe we need to, uh, you know, we're selling that we need to detect and notify public 
vulnerabilities in, in existing images, um, as well as prevent uh, within 24 hours. And we need to prevent new problems from being pushed into that registry so where they could be deployed. And then we need some workflow support uh, to help make sure that these things get updated in a timely manner. And then we can track it and understand that they've been fixed. So <clears throat> technically, let's say the CI system was CircleCI. And let's say the uh, artifact repositories were Artifactory and Elastic Container Registry out on the deployment side. So we're not going to change those. Like this, I mean, we shouldn't have to, but like, there's a lot of things that you're just not going to be able to change that you're going to have to integrate with. Um, and let's say from a scale perspective, we need to support hundreds of Docker image repositories, which is, a, which is essentially the number of like, containerized applications. Uh, and uh, that we're, we have a delivery pipeline of like 10 image builds per day. And this data can be used in a lot of ways. Like, there's a lot of pricing models that change or like, come out with very different numbers depending on like, what you plug into these things. So it needs to be part of the context that we use to evaluate things. Uh, so I talked about a couple, uh, three use cases so far, detecting known vulner vulnerabilities at build time, detecting vulnerabilities in images, and then updating those vulnerable images. And so we're going to focus in the solution side on the update. So let's just put a little bit of uh, context and, and elaboration around that use case. So when we have a vulnerable image, that has been identified in the system based on that threat intelligence that usually goes to the security engineer, the system should trigger some updates and rebuilds of those images uh, if a fix is available uh, so that those can be made available for deployment. And as we're thinking about how we're going to solve this problem, like, we should really always keep in mind, like, why is it that the current system succeeds or fails? And the difference between success and failure is often not very much, and not anything proximal to the people immediately surrounding it, like whether that's an operations engineer or whatever. And, we, and this is not a uh, blameless postmortem or uh, you know, like a human error uh, talk. But we should be very careful when designing systems to think about like, the lines between success and failure and, and, or the continuum, um, and like, how things can combine to create good or bad outcomes um, that are independent of the people operating that process. And yeah, this will be on the test, in case you're wondering. Uh, so let's move on to developing and evaluating solutions. Because now we have a good sense of what the problem is. Uh, and this is the fun part, in a sense. We get to think and explore and iterate and whiteboard and so forth. Uh, first, I, I recommend considering, you know, how is it that we can simplify the system? Uh, complexity is the enemy of robustness and security and many of the things that we really consider as good attributes of a, of a robust design. Um, and so there are some approaches that you can take to simplifying your system. You can retire functionality that is no longer needed. You can consolidate disparate workflows uh, into a few standard ones. And then, perhaps now that you have a few standard workflows, you can build some tooling that helps support that, that conventional usage in a robust way. Uh, we can refactor data models that are spread across uh, different services, and, or we could collapse things uh, and co-locate activities that we know belong together. Like perhaps you have, you know, this service is talking to that service and it fails quite a bit. Like, well, if you move them closer together on the network or like in the same process, sometimes those, things, sometimes those problems go away. Sometimes they get worse. That's why the context is important. Uh, definitely at a high level when we're thinking about solutions, we need to think about how we can unload people. So I mentioned that the, the people are what makes a system resilient. They're the, they're the folks who fill in the gaps and like run things and so forth. And what we can do to unload people is provide trustworthy information to support decision making. Uh, we can automate the tedious and mundane. Uh, and we can create, again, robust tools that make that conventional path simple safe and efficient. And this is how you address things like burnout, which is a serious issue in our industry and other industries. But you know, 
Let's talk about our industry for a minute. Um, how can we maximize flow? We want, we want good stuff to get to production quickly at high volume. Um, so we can reduce variation. Uh, we can provide automation that implements many of those steps. And we should really be thinking and like going and specifically trying to ident identify where there is friction, where there are errors, um, where there's rework loops. Um, I've been uh, in situations where even just getting people in the room and drawing that diagram and showing like, hey, there's a re re rework loop there, they're like, oh yeah, you know what? We actually don't need to do that anymore. We can just relocate this step over here um, and eliminate the possibility of an error. Uh, so now that we've, we've asked some high-level questions, we should draw how work flows in an improved system. And so here's, uh, here's a change. So we've moved a significant chunk of the work from people down into the system and its automation. We've added some, some things. So in the update vulnerability, uh, we use case, we specifically have added this component, which is now receiving threat intelligence. So it's not just the security engineer that receives the threat intelligence anymore. Um, there's, a, there's an automated process that's doing it. And that automated process is now able to like, look through its catalog, look through the catalog of images, and say, like, OK, these are vulnerable, and we need to update them. And so let's fire off some events. Um, and so. Uh, this is, by, by moving things around, like where, where things happen in the system and who does them, um, that's really like one of the core elements of system design. And then being able to standardize those workflows and, and, and make them, uh, provide the robust implementation for them, um, that's, that's really the core of system design. And we can use it to, we can use in t uh, directed system design to achieve the KPIs that we want, the, the key performance indicators. So we might uh, be very interested in time to resolve a vulnerability. We might be interested in minimizing the time that customer data or, re or revenue is at risk from a vulnerability, which are kind of maybe two sides of the same coin. But depending on who you're speaking to, you might need to explain it in different ways, like a VP of uh, marketing or uh, customer engagement is going to be much more interested in knowing that, like, okay, you're doing something to minimize the time at which our customer's data is at risk. I get that. Here's some money. Um, and so now is the point in the program where we can start talking about, like, how do we actually implement this thing and alternatives? Um, and, like, boom, uh, logos. Like, there's all kinds of solutions. Like, now we're talking about tools. Right? Not at the front end of the project. This isn't a, and, and I'll, actually all of these vendors are good, so I don't want to like, uh, you know, select uh, one favorably. But this is not a, this is not an install a tool project. This is a reduce the attack surface um, and exposure of customer data project. Um, let's focus on the customer goals. So returning to our update vulnerability use case, like, OK, so that previous block diagram, maybe that works when I'm communicating outside of the team and like, it's great, it's kumbaya, but like, like I may have been doing it while I was speaking. I was maybe, maybe waving my hands a little bit. Like, specifically, how are we going to do that? So we can express that in something like a sequence diagram. And this doesn't have to be a sequence diagram, but I find that sequence diagrams are very good at ferreting out like, OK, let's take this high level hand wavy thing and like, what specifically is going to talk to what? Um, to implement the solution. And one of the things you might have noticed is like, okay, we're going to have our threat intelligence, we're going to talk to the artifact scanner, okay, that's cool. And it's going to identify the vulnerable images, it's got some sort of magic catalog inside it, like that's what the marketing said, so that's fine. Um, and then there's this like event that's like, oh yeah, you should notify something, this build uh, job manager of like what the vulnerable images are. Like, well, wait a minute, that, Stephen, that didn't appear on that previous block diagram. You just invented something. And like, yeah, I did. But, and that's exactly why we do this exercise, uh, is because this is, this is the unscoped, um, like, we didn't anticipate needing to build this thing, but like, this thing is the glue that binds our system together and integrates. And uh, in the group talk earlier, 
there was like, oh, every time we got by a tool, like we got to like work to integrate it. And that's true. So like we need to make sure this, like in a sequence diagram or similar exercises, to make sure that we can literally connect the dots. Um, and that data uh, is going to flow in the, in the directions and at the times that we want. Um, so switching gears a bit, you know, every system has limits. And we cannot optimize a system for every attribute. Some things are going to be very, very scalable. Some things are going to be very, very available. Um, those, are, those are very close together. Um, but consistency uh, and availability are often trade-offs. Um, there's a cap theorem about that. So what we need to do is we need to capture what our system needs in terms of performance, availability, scalability, and security. So that's, that's what I was talking about earlier, really, with the number of images and, and containers um, that our system needs to handle and the number of builds. So let's dig into one of these attributes. If we were to, to say, describe the performance requirements for the most important per, uh, and lowest latency uh, use cases, we might do that in terms of like a 95th or 99th percentile on response time or so forth. And then we also need to think about how are we going to validate that. And so in this new system, we might have a cycle time for resolving a vulnerability that is 60, 60 minutes for identification, uh, 45 minutes for the resolution to rebuild that thing automatically, uh, and then 90 minutes to deployment for a three and a quarter hours total. And this is way less than our starting point of more than 48 hours. So transitioning again, we need our system to give people information and control. Um, we don't need to give them work. We need to give them information so that they can make decisions. We also need to make sure that they understand that, uh, that they know if the system is working or not. Uh, we need to design monitoring points for the top use cases. So some, a you know, set a strategy and, and tactics quickly about uh, monitoring is that we want to learn about problems before our customers do. Uh, and we, we want to be able to speed resolution by being able to like, identify the unhealthy thing quickly. And there's, there's several ways we can do that. Um, but at a, at a high level, we're interested in things like error rates. And this could be for orders. It could be for database transactions. Um, on down through like how much work is our system doing, how much value is it providing with throughput, uh, how long does it take to do that, and what is the variance? And are parts of the system saturated? Um, and we, we also want to be very certain that we know that valid data is being stored safely. And over the past couple days, GitHub has had some challenges. And I love their incident report that they published on Monday, talking about specifically that they have taken steps to protect customer data by shutting non-essential things down, or shutting things down that could corrupt things, even though they are essential. Um, this, is, this is the level of responsibility and maturity you want in your engineering organization and your designs. So thank you, GitHub. Um, and then we need to be talking about, like, what is this going to cost? We need to estimate the cost of like, how to build and operate this system. Uh, this is what stakeholders need to decide whether they're going to fund it. Uh, and in particular, we need to make sure that we understand that people, uh, the, 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 the requirements that we're putting on people to run and, and maintain this system. Going back to that half an engineer, like can we build this new thing and run it with half an engineer? That's the budget. Uh, because systems that require a bunch of people to, in order to scale are going to be very hard to scale because people are usually uh, a tough constraint. And this brings me to that we are not going to be able to design the perfect thing. And that we will ship things before they are perfect. Uh, the Death Star, multiple Death Stars were shipped before they were done. Uh, or sorry, before they were perfect. Uh, they, you know, some were able to blow things up. Uh, some, uh, actually most of them, I think all of them, did get blown up. Um, but you know what? The business will move on. And it will do things without a perfect solution. And as engineers, as designers, we need to be comfortable with that. Um, your system is already a half-built Death Star. They're working within it. You're improving it. Uh, and this leads me to conclude that better is better than perfect. Like, we need to put ourselves on a tra trajectory where we continuously improve the system. And as long as we're making things better, like, that's a win in my book. Uh, so how do we review, decide, and execute? So we can, 
uh, assure quality and design similar to how we can do it in code. And there are ways to inspect and test designs. The inspection side, we conduct design reviews. And design reviews are very effective, ranging in, in effectiveness of finding defects that are present at that point in the delivery process of 25 to say 65%, depending on how much effort you're putting into that. Like literally, you will find 25 to 65% of the problems if you like do a design review. There's studies behind that. Uh, incorporate that feedback into your design. And now, consider testing the design with a prototype which is going to find defects, especially in how things integrate, um, at a rate of like 35 to 80%, which is amazing considering the expense of problems at this stage of the game uh, and their impact uh, to fix later. Uh, and of course, be prepared and plan to throw away that, impl uh, that, that prototype implementation once you've verified or invalidated the hypotheses. Um, I specifically sometimes choose tooling that can't be deployed to production. Like, let's just do this a bunch of bash. Um, because that's not the point. Like, building a production implementation is not the point right now. It's answering these questions. And learning is the point. And so once we've done all this learning, let's make some decisions. And instead of like having a meeting or a series of meetings where we're talking about the sa seemingly the same things over and over again, once we have um, uh, made a decision about how to do or not do something, Let's capture decision records, basically snapshots that context and why we made the decision at that point in time into an immutable document. And if we need to change our mind later, that's OK. We can make another decision record. But like, boom, make an ADR. Uh, Michael Nygaard has a great explanation of that. I want to close by saying that you can create robust and resilient systems, but it doesn't happen by accident. And so what I've outlined here albeit briefly, is a structured approach for doing that. And as I mentioned, there are, uh, I'm going to share my templates and so forth. But I want to leave you with, you know, at a high level, explore, think, write, get feedback, incorporate that feedback, and define that problem, evaluate multiple solutions, and then make a decision and move. Uh, the resources, the template, there will be a link to it in this presentation. I have already tweeted out a link to this uh, Pre presentation. Um, and you'll find it under that hashtag as well as my Twitter handle. Thank you.